uh, at the outset let me thank uh, uh, harmony india team for uh, organizing this wonderful academic session and uh, before i proceed and uh, uh, let me put two disclaimers before i start that uh, uh, i mean the topic was allotted to dr manish gupta but due to unforeseen circumstances i had to chip in and uh, that too in a topic uh, which has uh, generated lot of controversies and it's a very debatable topic and there is uh, again no clear cut consensus to, to uh, diagnose this topic and how to treat this topic so i'll try to make it uh, very simple and uh, concise so that we can take some a uh, few important messages at the end of my talk so uh if this would be my outline of the talk that is i will be discussing just about little bit of physiology then the clinical features diagnosis and treatment so uh what happens when uh, any sort of uh, threat happens to body be it a non infectious or a infectious threat that leads to a systemic inflammation and we all know for that threat be it infectious or a non infectious and it's a, a appropriately regulated it for the body to mount a, a adequate response and as with is with any time excess or the persistent inflammation would lead to this to destruction and as is that even a less systematic inflammation he also would mount a adequate response so if you look at the three major domains that how the body responds to any sort of stress that is the stress system mediated by uh, hpa axis that is the hypotetry hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis which would be prime focus of our talk going ahead and secondly the uh, that is the acute phase reaction and then subsequently the how the ta target body uh, target organ responds uh, to its defense uh, against the uh, threat which has occurred to the body so uh, this is what happens in the physiology that is at the rest uh, this is hypothalamus and the uh, humoral and neuronal uh, regulation of the secretion of acth uh, occurs by crh and abp which we all know and uh, then uh, acth comes uh, then at this leads to secretion of uh, various adrenal hormones from the various uh, uh, layers of the adrenals this is what happens in the stress uh, in stress what happens is that apart from the conventional players in form of crh and abp uh, other players becomes very important that is the damp and the pmp that is the disease associated molecular pattern and the uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns they start playing an important role and the uh, subsequent slides i'll be discussing that how do they uh, play what are the proposed mechanism that by the way this thing occurs so uh, these uh, we can say that it is uh, not only the direct effect of these molecules but as well as there are uh, it does lead to the activation of autonomic nervous system as is because for example this is a inflamed tissue and uh, these are the nerve terminals of the systemic uh, uh, nervous system and these get activated and these leads to the increase of uh, secretion of crh and subsequently uh, this uh, pathway through which it leads to secretion of increased uh, cortisol apart from that there are other toll like receptors which has been uh, proven again that uh, it, it they are there at the level of the uh, adrenals as well uh, that is in the layer of zona zona uh, fasciculata and that leads to the increased uh, secretion or for that matter increased response of the adrenals towards the threat which has occurred to the body and uh, as i said in the beginning anything uh, which a body is mounting a response uh, it has to uh, have a balance between uh, systemic inflammation as well as the the uh, the signal which is getting uh, that is the activated and dysregulated hp axis so uh, the what happens when there is uh, sepsis or for that matter any septic shock that is there is overwhelming systemic inflammation and which is primarily driven by the hyperactivated inflammatory pathways which is uh, by like classically by the nfkb path signal system and because of the less activated and dysregulated hp axis uh, response so when this imbalance occur that is what leads to the overwhelming systemic inflammation and that is when our patients can go into septic shocks and 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 uh, various other complications of the uh, primary disease and that is what has led to this term that is the critical illness related corticoid insufficiency and uh, uh, this term uh, was a few decades back this uh, term used to be known as a uh, relative adrenal insufficiency but uh, in 2008 this term was given and uh, this is uh, to say that this is a dysregulated systemic inflammation resulting from inadequate intracellular glucocorticoid mediated 
anti inflammatory activity for the severity of patients uh, critical illness and uh, while we are using this term that is the critical illness related corticoid corticosteroid insufficiency we have to be very careful while using this term that this term should not be used in patients who have already have any sort of adrenal beat primary or secondary adrenal insufficiency and why do we need to study about this and why do we need to understand this is that because uh, it has been shown in multiple studies that uh, patients who does have critical illness related corticoid corticosteroid insufficiency they have increased length of icu stay increased mortality and they do have uh, higher levels of biomarkers of inflammation as well as the various other uh, uh, complications now uh, if you look at the prevalence of what is this uh, corticosteroid insufficiency in critical illnesses that depends upon the population studied as well as the diagnostic criteria because uh, the, the diagnostic criteria as i said in the beginning that the disclaimer which i put that it's a very debatable topic and still there are a lot of uh, areas in this topic which uh, does lack a consensus among uh, clinician as well as the intensivists so if you look at the prevalence it is around 10 to 20% in the critically ill patients and if you look in the septic shock patients that is around more than 50% now uh, we all know from our, our basic uh, physiology as well as uh, that uh, adrenals are very important for our physiology and even when body is mounting a response towards any sort of threat that is be it an infectious or a non infectious threat they do have a very important role to play because if they are not functioning properly or if the body is not able to mount a adequate response then these sort of things which start happening that is it will lead to a decreased gluconeogenesis that patients may end up into hypoglycemia there will increase capillary permeability vasodilatation that what leads to the uh, onset of septic shock or shock and that that they, it can have effect on the uh, brain function as well and patients can have delirium fatigue and as well as the uh, various other things and um, and one most important thing is that is the uh, effect of uh, steroids of that matter corticosteroids on the immune cell that leads to the when they are not mounting adequate response that leads to the increase inflammatory cytokines increase uh, risk of uh, severe inflammatory uh, shock syndrome and as well as the various other end organ damage so that is why it is important for body to mount uh, adequate response during any sort of stress and if you look at the mechanisms that why and how does it this uh, uh, concept evolved and why it happens so initially as i said the term used to be relative adrenal insufficiency and over the time it has evolved that initially it was thought that uh, probably adrenals are not able to mount an adequate response then it was thought that the acth is uh, probably not getting secreted properly because of the various uh, mechanisms which has been uh, proposed but over over the time it has emerged and it has been proven in any uh, uh, problem with the adrenals or for that matter any sort of problem with the pituitary but rather the majority of the problems lie in the alteration of the uh, corticosteroid metabolisms and what happens is that whenever patient is having sepsis or any sort of illness there is a reduced production of corticosteroid binding globulins there is decreased cortisol transport and that is what leads to the increased levels of the uh, free cortisol so it has been proven in studies that the if you look at the total cortisol levels in patients who are having cortisol for that matter, general population the total cortisol level not differ but in, uh, if you measure the free cortisol free cortisol levels differ so that is what has uh, the metabolism which is getting altered in the patients who are having inflammation at metric critical is uh, the target tissue resistance that is the inadequate glucocorticoid receptor alpha activity and the uh, decreased level of uh, activity of the corticosteroids which body is producing or which, which body is mounting against the threat which has occurred and that is what has i mean i'll be discussing in this uh, further ahead but that is what has led to the some people who propose that as there is tissue resistance to the corticosteroids so you sh we should be using a higher dose of uh, corticosteroids while we are treating any sort of septic shock or uh, uh, for that matter when patients are uh, getting diagnosed with uh, corticosteroid related critical illness if we talk about symptoms and sign i would say they are very non specific and to see it in that they are just the extension of the what the primary problem has occurred to the patient and uh, these all we know from the previous talks which uh, 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 the other speakers have highlighted that the is uh, which can occur in patients with a primary as well as secondary adrenal insufficiency but a few of the important things which uh, we do need to have 
always uh, keep in our mind that when do we have to suspect this uh, thing that is the corticosteroid related insufficiency of criti in critical illness. So when patients are not responding to adequate doses of uh, vasopressure, when patients are not responding to adequate resuscitation, when patients has new onset of any hyponatremia, hypercalcemia, we know that this can occur in primary renal insufficiency as well. So then do, we do have to keep a watch that this, is, this patient might be having uh, th this uh, corticosteroid insufficiency. But again, I would just say that the symptoms are non-specific and we have to be careful while diagnosing and while uh, interpreting, in interpreting these symptoms. Now, now comes the very uh, uh, controversial area, the, the few slides which I have uh, tried to put in as again, the, as I said in the beginning, there is no consensus regarding this topic. So if you look at the diagnosis, uh, there was a guidelines published in 2017 by the uh, Society of Critical Medicine and in which they have said that there is no consensus regarding whether to use a delta cortisol, that is to, of the change in the baseline cortisol at 60 minutes of less than 9 micrograms per deciliter after post intropin stimulation or random plasma cortisol of less, uh, uh, less than 10 microgram per deciliter for the diagnosis of this uh, corticosteroid insufficiency. And one more approach which has been again suggested, but again, it has been not proven in studies is whether the hemodynamic response to hydrocortisone is can be used. So again, the call is uh, to you, but again, uh, if you look at the data, majority of the studies which have done the studies in terms of uh, what they're trying to look into is that the uh, hydrocortisone dose or for that matter, whether initial for them, uh, these patients in terms of mortality or not, majority of them have not used random cortisol, but rather they have used the delta cortisol value. So if available, delta cortisol can be used to uh, again uh, get an idea that yes, whether this patient will be having any benefit in terms of giving a corticosteroids for his uh, uh, septic shock or for that matter, any uh, critical illness. Now, Few alternatives to diagnosis. Again, this is with any uh, cortisol thing which we start discussing, we pushing, or for that matter, other things. These do things do come. Uh, uh, so, in this uh, patients also free cortisol as well as the salivary, salivary free cortisol levels have been tried, but again, recommendations till 2018 are that yes, uh, these are not yet proven because we do lack normative data. And again, the difficulty in terms of uh, the availability of these resources for the quick diagnosis. Now comes again the most important and how we manage these patients. We can use two methods to diagnose the patient with random cortisol, but again, like I said, there is uncertainty in the data. And the data which has been there and which has been done, they do prove a few things. If you look at in terms of hemodynamic status response for that uh, and the organ organ dysfunction response, uh, hemodynamic uh, uh, dysfunction response, saying that the patients who have uh, who do response quickly give a response in terms of their resolution of the shock. So there is benefit in terms of that, but survival benefit if there is a doubt, doubt regarding the survival benefit. So I'll be quickly taking through few important studies and few uh, probably uh, landmark studies uh, which has been done in uh, regard to this. So this was a study, uh, let's go back to, uh, this was a study way back 20, that was a, it was a placebo control line study and it was 300 patients and all the patients were done as a short simulation test. It was six hourly plus two cortisone 50 microgram once daily. And they tried to look at the 20 survival benefits of non responders. As I said, in the beginning, this is a very good uh, uh, diagnostic test which can be done to see whether it will be beneficial for his survival or not. This uh, delta cortisol thing. And in this study, it was benefit at the end of 28 days when patients are giving hydrocortisone plus pseudocortisone. Now, after this, a new study came that is the Cortica study in 2006 and it gave a completely different result. And even in, though in this study, short selectin stimulation test was done. But again, the difference here is that here the patient were given only hydrocortisone, not the fludrocortisone, and that was compared with the placebo. And we can see that all cause mortality benefit was 
cortisone when it was compared with the placebo but the probability of resolution of septic shock was uh, better with hydrocortisone when compared with the placebo so mortality benefit is again two studies i have shown that is this one it is showing a good mortality benefit but this is showing not the mortality benefit now again as i said in the sepsis with shock and sepsis without shock so there is a clear consensus at least on this thing that sepsis without shock there is probably no role of uh, hydrocortisone and this is what again was uh, proven by a, a study that is the or or placebo and they were looked into the time to onset of uh, shock and it was no difference between hydrocortisone versus placebo so severe sepsis without shock there is no role of hydrocortisone so these are the what rec recommendations are and as we have, uh, this this was published in 2017 and after a uh, few meta analysis are also there but again they are there is no but after looking into lot of uh, uh, papers and this society for critical care medicine came with again, this was a weak recommendation that they suggest using the corticosteroids in patient with septic shock that is not responsive to fluid we have to be uh, very careful here that is not responsive to fail fluid or that is not responsive to moderate to high dose of uh, norepinephrine or equivalent vasopressor now again as i said with sepsis without shock there is no role of hydrocortisone this is very clear now after this uh, uh, 2017 paper uh, came uh, there were few studies which uh, came in 2018 and 2019 which again gave a conflicting result which i'll be taking you through next once we have started with the hydrocortisone now we have to be seeing that whether what is the dose and duration and as seen with the uh, i would give of uh, uh, body had the different dosing of regards to uh, hydrocortisone what was done in the recovery trial which was done by the nhs it, it did give us uh, something different dexamethasone but in our country everybody had a different protocol regarding the giving uh, regarding the hydrocortisone dose so similarly that is the case here as well that there is no clear consensus that yes what should be the dose and how how much time it should be given and what should be the duration so this uh, guideline they have said that the dose should be less than 400 mg per day for 3 three, three days at full dose and they are saying that we have to give a low dose keeping into account that we then it may may have some adverse effect in terms of what hydrocortisone that but any steroids can cause like hypernatremia hyperglycemia and all those things so they are saying that we can go with the low dose and long course in uh, these patients with a septic shock now after uh, as i said after uh, 2017 two main two more papers came and they were uh, uh, published in anesium and they were uh, done on large number of the pop, uh, uh, population and large number of the patients and this was what the uh, uh, study which was done and in which they gave hydrocortisone plus cortisone uh, fludrocortisone for adults with septic shock and there were around 1200 patients study short synectin stimulation test was done and again important thing to note here is that the thing which was used here was hydrocortisone combined with the fludrocortisone and 90 day survival benefit was seen and as we can see here that there was significant benefit in terms of survival in when patients were given hydrocortisone plus fludrocortisone compared with the placebo now after this another paper came which was the adrenal study which was done in australia and this was study which was done uh, in patients who are having septic shock where can and there were large of the patients that is 3600 patients but one thing was short synectin stimulation for the recruitment or before the randomization of the patient so that is this all they did not use uh, fludrocortisone but rather they use only hydrocortisone and uh, they looked into the 90 day survival benefit and as we can see there was no benefit in terms of uh, placebo in this trial so uh, not to confuse anybody just i'll uh, summarize what i have discussed and uh, that yes this is a very important concept that is the corticosteroid insufficiency in critical illness and we have seen in multiple studies there is no doubt they have shown that it does increases the mortality and mortality morbidity in our patients and corticosteroids if at all is to be used it can be used in patients who are not responsive to vasopressors or they are not responsive to uh, adequate amount of fluid benefit of treatment is there only in septic shock and patients who are not having shock there is probably a doubtful benefit or probably not benefit if available if synectin as has been uh, uh, 
already said by previous speaker that sanitin is now easily available with us so if not availability is not an issue short sanitin uh, stimulation test uh, is a very important step which can be done which would predict that yes this patient would be uh, benefit benefiting from the uh, hydrocortisone and fluorocortisone therapy or not and uh, the studies which i have discussed they have shown one very clear thing that yes a uh, mortality benefit uh, may be doubtful thing but again the resolution of shock that is the time to resolution of the shock less days on mechanization these all studies have shown that these are the clear cut benefit in uh, those patients who are having sepsis with the shock and uh, one last thing which i would like to say is that whether adding fludrocortisone has shown benefit as we can see in the two uh, studies which have shown benefit in terms of mortality in those as uh, we saw that fludrocortisone was given along with the hydrocortisone but again the uh, people or the those who doubt or those who oppose this thing that yes we all know that once we are starting or once we are using hydrocortisone at higher doses uh, uh, the fludrocortisone activity or the mineralocorticoid activity also take is taken care of so again this is again a debatable and controversial thing but uh, as far as studies goes we can see that the patients who were uh, or the studies who were who were using hydrocortisone plus fludrocortisone they did show mortality benefit rather the patient rather rather the studies which used only hydrocortisone so with this i would like to thank you and uh, thank you for your kind attention